Now, today, uh, we're going to do chapters two and three from the book, Heavily Condensed. Chapter two is the three archetypes. A policy in regard to integration is not a primary. Intellectuals learn it ultimately from philosophers and then broadcast to minds in every field their different views of integration. So we have this question. Are there three different views of integration implied or explicitly stated by the most powerful philosophers of the centuries? And are there by chance only three such views? <clears throat> well, let us look at the three greatest philosophers in Western history by universal consent. Plato, Aristotle, and Kant. Of these, the most influential by far is Plato, who was the first to create a system of philosophy. Now, you know his ideas, I am assuming, uh, from at least my course on the history of philosophy. Reality is not this world, but not this world of the senses, but which is merely a world of shadows and appearance, but the world of forms, the world of abstract universals or essences, which is purely non-material. Now, the world of forms is hierarchical. It arises in tears and culminates in the supreme principle of reality, which Plato calls the form of the good. And later, followers of his, the Neoplatonists, called it the one. This form is what gives unity and value to the universe. It's the ultimate fact from which all the lower uh, forms, and thus their worldly shadows, flow. And it's also the ultimate value, and as such, it is the good which all other goods aspire to. Now, knowledge in this view is not based, obviously, on sensory observation, but on innate ideas, which Plato thought were acquired during an earlier life. The thinker, therefore, must reorient his mental faculty. He must turn away from sensible objects and toward the forms. Gradually, by means of thought alone, he grasps the logical connections among these pure abstractions. Finally, he has a mystic experience of the pinnacle of reality. And the grasp of this ineffable form enables a person to understand how everything else follows from it. He knows at last why all things are as they are and how human life ought to be lived. So Plato's approach to integration as a result amounts to this. This world, being only partly real, is not the object of proper integration. To integrate on the basis of sense data, he says, is only a pointless game for prisoners in the cave. An insignificant integration of shadows. Significant integration for Platonism <clears throat> pertains not to this world, but to its transcendent source. Transcendent is a technical, a pleasant sounding word for supernatural. Both mean above this world. <clears throat> uh, now, in the higher world, by definition, induction from experience is ruled out. Uh, in integration is achieved only by means of logic apart from perception. And logic here, of course, is restricted to deduction. Now, when Plato wrote deduction in the sense of step-by-step -step inference from a set of axioms had not yet been clearly analyzed or formalized. So Plato was content to indicate that there are rational connections among the forms, but in grasping these, he allows the knower new intuitions along the way, intuitions that amplify a deductive progression but in ways that do not follow from any stated axioms. As an exponent of integration, however, Plato does not 
does not regard such intuitions as isolated cognitive thunderbolts, because that view would entirely subvert the idea of an integrated system. Instead, he holds that they can be connected to the rest and will be ultimately seen to follow directly without the need of logical inference from the forms which govern them. Platonism, in essence, is rationalism, along with everything this presupposes and implies. Now, this is very important to take this down. Rationalism is the advocacy of knowledge through concepts independent of percepts. That's my definition of it. Rationalism is the advocacy of knowledge through concepts independent of percepts. And that implies, as Plato is the first example of, it implies the advocacy of concepts as metaphysically primary and percepts as secondary. Concepts as the factor which create or shape uh, percepts, not the reverse. Now, Plato was a master integrator who understood fully and consciously the importance of the process, as I think you can see from this brief sketch. But by the definition of validity that I gave you last time, Plato, though an epical innovator, his approach to integration is invalid. In essence, he supernaturalizes reality and the tools of cognition. Like most of the Greeks, he sought the one in the many. But in the end, he construed the one as a self-sufficient entity and wrote off the many as unreal. In this way, he is the preeminent champion, philosophically, of the one without the many. And this is the conclusion to which the method of invalid integration commonly leads. Because what happens is that narrower abstractions are contained within broader ones, and if abstraction is reality, therefore, all that ultimately emerges as real is the one all-encompassing uh, abstraction. Now, since Plato wrote, there have been many defenders through the centuries of his view of integration. I'll mention a couple so you get a sense of the variety that still come under this approach. St. Augustine is a Christian expression of Plato. The transcendent unity from which all comes is not an abstract goodness, but a personal God. And you may be interested to know that his mind, according to Christianity, is stocked with all of the Platonic forms. God creates the many, which is the world of natural, sensible objects, but these are merely the props in a divine play soon to close. Props which are devoid of autonomy, metaphysical value, and full reality. As to gaining knowledge, quote Augustine's famous aphorism, we must first believe in order that we may then know, unquote. That is the defining formula of Christian rationalism. The knower starts with premises in conceptual form, grounded solely in faith, and then deduces their implications apart from any reference to observation. So you see, in regard to rationalism, it is irrelevant whether a man turns aside from percepts in the name of principles which he regards as rationally self-evident, as Plato did, or because he starts with avowed dogmas that he accepts on faith in the form that Augustine did. The essence of both is the advocacy of concepts apart from percepts as the foundation of knowledge and ultimately as the essence of reality. <clears throat> now let's jump to the most influential Platonist of the modern era. You don't have to take all these down, but I just want to stretch your mind a bit so you don't think that every 
follower of Plato is a Platonist. I mean, he is. But he has, they, a lot of them have their own uh, system. Let's look at Hegel, the most influential Platonist of the modern era. Now, reality for him starts with three pure abstractions, being nothing and becoming, then evolves in a series of what he calls dialectic triads. First, it becomes a material world, and then an organic world, and then a human and cultural world. And the process is finally completed when all the elements are aufgehoben. They're put together, but they're not. And the result is the absolute, which is described by Hegel as a one without distinctions, although it also has distinctions. Now this unity, but the one is more important. Here. This unity is true reality. The material world of the many is merely an appearance, a relatively early stage in the cognitive, uh, in the cosmic development. And as to knowledge, of course, for Hegel, it's achieved by pure thought following what he calls logic, the dialectic method, which involves a ceaseless parade of accumulating contradictions. A, then non-A, then A and non-A, which becomes the A for the next, etc. Until all uh, of that progression disappears into, though it's retained by uh, the absolute. Now you get an idea of the tremendous variety of the primacy of concepts uh, in knowledge and in reality. All of that is the Platonic uh, approach. And there are others, which you'll hear about in this course, which will really surprise you, that I put them in with, I won't tell you. <clears throat> All right, let's go to another philosopher whom Dante called the master of them who know namely Aristotle. Now, of course, he had a very different system of philosophy. And again, I assume you have a general idea. Reality is this world, the world which we perceive by our senses, which are valid. There are no innate ideas. There is no knowledge gained by intuition, no knowledge gained by faith. The mind at birth is a tabula rasa, and all knowledge must be based on sensory data obviously, of objects uh, in this world. The only means we have of moving beyond such data is the faculty of abstraction from the observed. In other words, concepts. Now, I think you can summarize Aristotle's theory of concepts, uh, from my perspective, in four points. Concrete, not abstractions, make up reality. The ultimate referent of concepts is percepts, the objects we perceive. Concepts are not arbitrary constructs. They are based on objective identities running through a group of percepts. And percepts, to be known in the human sense, must be conceptualized. So you see that Plato's withdrawal from perception and the world of concretes, in Aristotle's view, is 100% wrong every way across the board. Now, Aristotle is one of the very few philosophies in history that is neither empiricist nor rationalist. He's not an empiricist. I haven't introduced that term, but basically empiricists are people who say all knowledge begins in experience, and usually they say and ends there, as we'll see. He holds that experience is the beginning of knowledge, but not its end. And he's not a rationalist because he rejects any idea of intuitively self-evident conceptual statements <coughs> as the starting point <coughs> of knowledge or science. Rather, he demands that a ladder of ever broader inductions from experience precede the discovery of basic principles and of any deductive exposition of one's findings. So Aristotle upholds not the many in isolation and not the one in isolation, but the integration of percepts and concepts. In other words, the one in the many. 
The unity of Plato's cosmos lies in the connection, both in reality and in our minds, of pure forms apart from matter. The unity of Aristotle's cosmos, by contrast, lies in the connection in both realms of form with matter. Uh, that summarizes the whole thing. Now, this indicates what I regard as the distinctive principles of Aristotle's philosophy. These are the principles that shaped later Aristotelian cultures. There were Platonic elements in Aristotle, but it was not Aristotle the Platonist who moved the world when he did. It was Aristotle the anti-Platonist. Aristotle's system is the first to define and demand this worldly integration to be achieved by rational, that is, conceptual slash perceptual means. As such, it is the archetype of valid integration. Now, if Augustine represents the fusion of Christianity with Platonism, his counterpart and opposite is who? Thomas Aquinas, who represents the fusion of Christianity with Aristotelianism. Now, since Aquinas acknowledges that many of his Christian elements are based on faith, his system could be perhaps justifiably classified as a case of invalid integration. But I don't take that view. I place Aquinas in the same integrative tradition as Aristotle. And my reason is that in the fundamental issues of philosophy, the ones that give rise to a view of integration, Aquinas' system gives the Aristotelian principles primacy and shunts Christianity to a secondary role. After centuries of the worship of dogma, Aquinas taught that reason, the reason in the full Aristotelian sense, starting with perception, he taught that reason is a self-sufficient, secular faculty. Contrary to Augustine, who had ruled for hundreds and hundreds of years, Aquinas said faith is not the base of reason, and it may not contradict the conclusions of reason. Reason, he said, is the authoritative faculty. Faith is merely a supplement which helps to fill in the blanks on questions where reason is silent. And you see how that opened the door to people coming up with secular answers and there were no more place, no more blanks to fill in. Similarly, Aquinas taught the natural world governed by Aristotelian logic is fully real. It's not a lower order appearance. And sensory observation interpreted by reason is the only objective ground on which to achieve knowledge. So he's obviously no rationalist. And this applies even to the supreme fact for him, God. He has no platonic insight or conceptual ladder which he jumps to ignoring this, uh, ignoring this world. He believes you have to prove God and you have to prove him starting with sensory perception, which is, you know, death to religion although he didn't know it. So he presented five arguments, each starting with an observed fact. Now, that, that they're invalid is irrelevant. From his point of view, God, so far from subverting nature, is an inference from it. And of course, you know, a conclusion can embody no greater reality than its premises. So if the facts of nature are what we need to prove God, then nature has primacy and God is something that we get from it. In the same way, we only know atoms because of nature and because of the observation of nature. So observation is the primary on which atoms depend. You can't say they're more real uh, than the observations which lead to them. Now, I don't think he was aware of that. It took a few years. That's why... I say that the Aristotelian element wins out in Aquinas, uh, and uh, that proved out culturally in his historical influence. So despite 
you know, these seeming tremendous obstacles, I have no problem with identifying Aquinas as an advocacy of valid integration. Now there is one third famous uh, advocate of valid integration in the history of philosophy, you guess. Now let's go to the last of the three great archetypes, Kant, who starts out by agreeing with his skeptic predecessor, Hume, but undertakes to solve this problem by means of what he calls the Copernican Revolution. The world has to adapt to us rather than the other way around. Kant's solution lies basically in his view. Now, Kant puts everybody to sleep in the first paragraph, so just try to get through one paragraph. Kant's solution lies basically in his view that the human mind is innately furnished with a dozen a priori concepts or categories, along with some other similar devices, but that's enough for us. The action of these mechanisms transforms the raw data from reality, which presumably would otherwise reach our minds. It imposes absolutely, absolute necessary laws on the data, including, by the way, their sensory, their spatiotemporal character. And this imposition by our innate concepts creates, creates the orderly, reliable, noble world in which we live. It has to go through our filter before we know it, and when it does, all we know is a world which obeys its laws, causality, etc. But since this is a world of our own making, <coughs> It is subjective, quote, merely human. It is not reality, but merely reality as processed by man. Uh, uh, or as he calls it, the phenomenal world. In the act of creating it, our minds have thereby cut themselves off from things in themselves, or the noumenal world. The latter, therefore, in other words, Kant's idea of true reality, is in principle, well, he doesn't have an idea of it by his philosophy, but his name for this unknowable and inconceivable true reality is the noumenal world. Now, Kant, as you see, rejects the cognitive claims made by traditional philosophers for percepts and for concepts. Because reality is just out altogether of our cognitive possibility. Now, he does have a significant agreement with Plato. He agrees with Plato that percepts do not give rise to our conceptual framework. On the contrary, he argues again with Plato, the world-shaping concepts come first. And the things we perceive are their product. So it's absolutely the primacy of concepts over percepts. Pure Plato. But, but, and here he becomes Kant. These concepts he holds as against Plato. These concepts that we have in us represent no grasp of reality, nor can they be validated by inference from any kind of axiom, uh, such as Plato or even Augustine advocate. Now, I want you to see, just on this tiny little fragment of his view, his attitude to integration, which is unprecedented in all history. He takes aim directly and explicitly at the very nature of the process, the process of integration itself. Now, for details, you'll have to read the part in the Critique of Pure Reason, which he calls the Transcendental Deduction of the Categories, and which is the heart of his proof and of his whole system. But what it amounts to is this. I mean, I'm condensing like... Uh, a drunken theory of relativity into a sentence. But 
<clears throat> That's the best I can do at this time. The categories, he tells us, achieve their crucial world-creating result because of their distinctive function. These c concepts are a priori synthesizing mechanisms of various types. They are synthesizing mechanisms provided by the mind apart from reality. Without them, there would be only what he calls tegeget a ungraspable human, and then his word, manifold. A many, a manifold of data which are ungraspable and meaningless until synthesized, until integrated. But integration, of course, can't be done on the Platonic or the Aristotelian model. So it's something that has to be fed by the mind and thereby cut us off uh, uh, from uh, reality. The categories using my language for Kant are the mind's fundamental integrators, which unite this uh, manifold. In other words, they are what creates a one out of the many. So the process of integration, in other words, is the original sin of cognition. It is the process which expels man from the Eden of reality and pushes us into the unreality of the phenomenal world. In other words, integration which is man's method of knowledge, is its destroyer. Integration, which is our means of knowing reality, is what stops us uh, from knowing reality. It's the cognitive villain. Now, a philosophy such as this, you cannot say merely dispenses with integration or even merely rejects it. It is a declaration of war against integration. Now, Kant's denial of the reality of this world is very, very different from Plato's. Kant does not deny this world in the name of a higher world, as Plato did. He denies it in favor of the inconceivable. In other words, of nothing. Nothing as far as human consciousness is concerned. In other words, he denies it for the sake of the denial. Nor, unlike Augustine, does he deny man's consciousness on the grounds of its inferiority to a superior infinite consciousness. As Ayn Rand has shown in one of her most brilliant observations, Kant condemns man's consciousness precisely because it requires a means of consciousness. In other words, because it is conscious. Now, it is only a reformulation uh, of these points to say that it is the very same philosophy uh, of these fundamental negations that we see here when he denies integration because it is integration. On all this basis, I maintain that Kant is the first and greatest nihilist in the history of thought, with no predecessors. Not in his sense. And if you want a definition of nihilism, which we're going to use quite frequently, I define it as one who works to destroy man's mind and values. In other words, what he is after is nihil, which is Latin for nothing. <clears throat> but he's after something. He wants to turn the something into nothing. <clears throat> 
Now, Kant was a devout Christian, just like Aquinas. But this is not the reason he became a historic figure, and it is not the essence of his viewpoint. His Christianity, I would describe analogically as a few dying shoots still poking up from the barren numinal soil. And these shoots, these growths were quickly uprooted by the main line of his uh, successors, who just threw the unknowable aside as unknowable, therefore, let's forget it. And then they had their own procedure from there, as we'll see. So you see, a thinker such as Aquinas, who gives reason primacy over faith, can't help but subvert religion, however, uh, however religious he is, whatever his intention. And the same is true of Kant, who gave nihilism primacy over faith. He can't help but subvert religion, no matter what he does. Now, as we'll see, all this subversion could only go so far. Now, another point here. It's really important that you understand Kant, because he is a major, major figure in understanding the world today. And I mean specifically his approach to integration. Kant reaches his conclusions uh, systematically, uh, but he is not a system builder. On the contrary, he is an anti-system builder. Historically, he is the main eradicator of system building in Western philosophy. He presents an intricate argument, true, in order to show that argument is futile. That is, argument about reality. He integrates a very complex series of premises in order to prove that integration is invalid. Now, a systematic argument that the questions of physics are unanswerable is not a system of physics. It is the opposite. And the same applies to a systematic negation of philosophy. Now, let's look at Hume for a moment in relation to Kant. If you look at him as, as an advocate of integration or as a, his theory of integration, he's just as much of a nihilist uh, as Kant. <clears throat> but there is still an important difference <clears throat> between Hume and uh, Kant in this issue. Hume, having discarded all knowledge of reality, is old-fashioned enough to bewail as ignorance. <clears throat> he claims to prove that a lunatic is philosophically interchangeable with a sane man, but then admits that, despite his treatise, sanity and not lunacy is what practical life uh, requires. <clears throat> so he concludes that philosophy is an idle amusement which men are well advised to ignore. Now, this kind of attack on integration could not have generated a cultural movement because an idle amusement has a short lifespan. Kant, however, was not playing games. He was creating a new type of man, which we can call the modernist, who did not exist before. Because skepticism for Kant, I'll try and take this in, skepticism for Kant is not a negative, but a positive. That's implicit in what I've said. It is not a blow causing paralysis as to Hume, but the gateway to a life of action and fulfillment. If we seek to know reality, Kant tells us, then we're in Hume's position. We're helpless. <clears throat> but if we give up this age-old quest, if we smash 2,300 years of philosophy with a transcendental hammer and proudly flaunt our ignorance, then we are free to create the kind of world we need. Paradoxically, therefore, 
The enemy of man is the individual who upholds the old-fashioned belief in the power of the human mind. The enemy is the individual who struggles to preserve and protect what he ignorantly calls, quote, rational values. The truth is that our thoughts and values cannot be rational in the traditional sense because both depend on our exploding the old-fashioned myth of man's, quote, rational faculty, which grasps reality, whether out of Plato or Aristotle. Now, to turn a mind's confession of bankruptcy, I can know nothing. Our consciousness is worthless. Uh, Our means of knowledge is the destroyer of knowledge to turn that into the base of a promising new way of life is an unprecedented feat which has had unprecedented consequences. Now, there had been many earlier outbreaks of simple skepticism. I don't know, who knows, nobody knows about whatever question. The ancient world witnessed that, the Hellenistic world witnessed that, The Renaissance certainly witnessed that. But all those had been viewed as brief bursts of disillusion to be quickly answered and dismissed with a new system of ideas. But Kant is the reason why that never happened after him. He's the reason why skepticism endured and why in our own day it still reigns triumphant. Now, uh, maybe a touch on his followers. There were followers, especially in 19th century Europe, who worked out a post-Kantian version of rationalism. Uh, So, in other words, Kant influenced the rationalist tradition. And the main one there is Hegel and his countless disciples. We took a quick look at him. That did not, however, change the mode, uh, uh, method of integration, the approach to integration of rationalism. But the dominant trend after Kant, especially in uh, England and the United States, was a post-Kantian version of empiricism. And here, the skepticism and nihilism uh, of the post-Kantians is just so eloquently expressed that I'm going to let the cases that I give you in subsequent lectures uh, speak for itself. But if you ever heard anybody say, uh, for instance, oh, that's a complex world. It's a uh, pluralistic world. You can't take some system of abstractions and try to put order on the brute uh, data. You have to take each case on its own terms and you're distorting reality if you, try to, if you try to put it all together, if you try to integrate. All of that is a, is a purely Kantian, hostile to integration uh, legacy. Now, I had to go through a few stages to get there, but the root is back in uh, uh, Kant's uh, critique of pure reason. Now, let me uh, encapsulate before we go on the three archetypes. <coughs> Plato, Aristotle, Kant, by identifying in purely emotional terms, and I know this is emotion, but I've already given it literally, uh, identifying in emotional terms their appeal to their champions through the centuries. Plato appeals, at the, let's put them all three at the best. Plato appeals to soaring idealism scornful of the practical. Aristotle appeals to joyous realism at home on earth. Kant appeals to rage. And that is the three uh, that we have at work. A glorious other world, this wonderful world, and kill everybody. Now let's go to uh, chapter three, 
which is called two variants. <clears throat> and I want to first explain to you why these two arose and look at each one separately. Broadly speaking, Western civilization after Greece has gone through three periods. A Platonic era, as from about 300 BC, right on through the Middle Ages. An Aristotelian era, which is from the Renaissance through the Enlightenment, the 18th century. And a Kantian era, the last two centuries. And this, as you'll see, means two further variants of the uh, three that we've already looked at. They're variants, so they're not brand new independent ones, but they're different in certain ways. Now let's just see what led to the first one. The first one in the modern world occurred when medieval Platonism encountered modern secularism. In other words, encountered the rising Aristotelianism. And especially when it encountered the unprecedented scientific achievements of the modern world, most eminently illustrated by Newton. Now, at that point, the Platonic view had to bow to the spirit of the times or be simply thrown aside. So it mutated. It retained its Platonism, but tried to bring in the secularism that could not be fought. Uh, its most influential exponents are Descartes and Spinoza, in the modern world, I say. And they held on to the basic rationalist premises of Plato. They're both rationalists. They held on to the primacy of the supernatural over the natural and of concepts over persons. But they rejected the idea that these premises entailed the metaphysical downgrading of this world into a realm of mere appearance. On the contrary, they held, and this is where the secularism was influencing them, this world is fully real, and they said, no matter how important certain non-empirical concepts are, no matter how independent of percepts and how much at the base of our knowledge, we still cannot simply banish percepts from cognition as Plato has said. They have a role to play. Now, this type of philosophy is Platonism, but with a key Aristotelian element added. So I identify it, hopefully not too sarcastically, as worldly supernaturalism. Now, you may think that this is a contradiction on his face, but it is certainly uh, not regarded as that by its advocates, as you'll see. Now, this form of Platonism in the modern world was dominant from the Renaissance through the 17th century, and it has had representatives in the various cultural fields uh, ever since then, as we'll see. It's rationalism mutating in the face of Aristotle. Now, the other one is empiricism mutating in the face of Kant. So let's get a general background for it. The early modern scientists, despite the fact that they denounced Aristotle as a medieval, did accept in practice every one of his essential tenets in regard to integration. But the early modern philosophers of empiricism, though they took from Aristotle many crucial ideas, downplayed one of his essentials, which they said that is rationalism, that is uh, scholasticism, that is Catholicism. And namely, Arist this is what they rejected. His view of the crucial function of concepts in human cognition. Now, these thinkers, the ones we're talking about, the early empiricists. Empiricism just means all knowledge is based on experience. But these thinkers did not uh, uh, deny that there was some role 
uh, to concepts. I mean, they weren't already post-Kantians. But their rallying cry, their basic premise was, the mind at birth is a tabula rasa, and all knowledge of reality therefore begins with experience of this world. Now that's the obvious empiricist credo. Now I describe this as empiric as Aristotelianism manque. And it led in due course, if you know the history of philosophy, because what can you do with experience without concepts? It led to empiricism smash up in Hume, and thus the receptivity of empiricists to Kant. Now, the empiricists after Kant, and that's what we're looking at now, agreed with him that all human knowledge is relative to the subjective constitution of the human mind, and that reality in itself is therefore unknowable. That has been ever since Kant. But against Kant, they didn't believe that this viewpoint entail the death of empiricism, or that it turns science, which they much admired, into a lowly recorder of the phenomenal world of mere appearance. So they were strong for experience, and strong for science, and strong for Kant. So how? Well, they said we can regain at least some part of the confidence of empiricism before Hume, not by rejecting Kant's skepticism, but by basing our outlook on his skepticism. By basing our outlook on his skepticism. And this, again, they thought involved no contradiction, and it was the only logical position to take, given uh, Kant. And the most uh, uh, eloquent representatives of this approach at least in the early years, I think are Auguste Comte and John Stuart Mill. And I identify this second variant as knowing skepticism. So we have worldly supernaturalism deriving from but contrasting to Plato and knowing skepticism deriving from but contrasting to Kant. Now you might ask, is there a variant of Aristotle? So I should have six instead of five. There have been lengthy periods during which Aristotle's ideas disappeared from the intellectual scene. But whenever they have reappeared, they are still his ideas and not a mutation. The reason is that Aristotle is the archetype of valid integration. Either a thinker holds that this world is the only reality and that it's known by the process of conceptualizing experience, or he doesn't. If he does, he's built into his philosophy the requirements of valid integration and thus the essentials of Aristotle. If he doesn't, if he rejects either of these, then he's outside the province of valid integration and of Aristotle altogether. The way Aristotle put it in a different context, there are many different ways to miss the target, but only one to hit it. In regard to integration, therefore, in addition to the three archetypes, we find only two variants, one coming from a Platonic background and the other from a Kantian. Now let's look at each reasonably briefly. Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, is by far the most influential Platonist to be deeply affected by modern secularism. As a Christian, Descartes holds that God is the only perfect entity, that he is the ultimate reality, who is the source and sustainer of all things, including our imperfect world. As a rationalist, Descartes holds that knowledge does not arise inductively from sense data, which, in fact, he regards as inherently confused, but arises deductively from a series of intellectual intuitions which the mind, independent of experience, finds, quote, what's the phrase? Clear and distinct. 
So directly or indirectly, these purely conceptual truths must flow from God because otherwise we wouldn't know that they are valid. We know they're valid because we know that a perfect being couldn't be a deceiver. And this is Descartes' version of the Augustinian notion that faith in God is the basis of cognition. Without such faith left to the experiences in our own minds, Descartes says, we could not even know that an external world exists. Now that's the orthodox platonic framework. But now within it, Descartes takes a principled secular turn. He rejects the idealist. Now idealist, I'm always using in a metaphysical sense, that the essence of reality is non-material. He rejects the platonic idealist dissolution of the material world into some form of unreality or hazy projection or shadow. A physical object Descartes maintains is real, fully as real as a mental object. And it is the task of reason to learn about and understand both these elements of reality. In studying nature, therefore, man is not sinking to the level of a stagnant prisoner in Plato's cave. Rather, he is using to the full his God-given rational faculty. You see the influence of Aquinas there, united here now with the fundamental Platonism. Now, physics was just being born at this time, and Descartes enthusiastically carried out his rationalist approach methodically in physics. He criticized Galileo's reliance on observation and experiment. That would be empirical. He held that physics must start with the fundamental principles of matter. Must start with that. Intuitively known apart from experience. And then deduce observed phenomena from them. The axioms of physics, he says, are, quote, now I'm stealing all of this from Dave Harriman, but the axioms of physics, he says, are, quote, naturally implanted in our minds, unquote. So, you know, they're innate, we just have to discover them. And there are really some pretty weird uh, axioms. One, for example, states that all matter is composed of three types of elementary particles differing only in size, shape, and movement. And this we know before any observation of matter. He then proceeds to, dis to deduce what he describes as the explanation of absolutely every phenomenon that we observe in the heavens above us, unquote, along with explanations of earthly phenomena ranging from earthquakes and volcanoes to magnetism and the tides. And all that comes from a few things about, you know, the shapes that start things off. Now, it's hardly need to be said that this is a very wrong-headed approach to physics. But the point here, which is nevertheless very important uh, to the history of the West, is Descartes' difference from the Platonists in regard to the relation of concepts and percepts. You cannot write him off as, oh, he's just another Platonist. Uh, uh. Plato is eager to free concepts from the stultifying and as he thinks, seductive world of percepts in order to revel intellectually in the pure world of abstract forms and ultimately their unifier. Uh, he wants a world of floating abstractions and scorns this world. Descartes, however, though he agrees that certain critical concepts, you know, are independent of percepts and come first, does not yearn for detached forms. He works diligently to show that, well, if not all of his innate abstractions, at least the most important of them, can be connected to real concretes. He is proud that he can show what are volcanoes and the stars and etc. cetera, whereas Plato would say, what a waste. Uh, in short, just as the worldly supernaturalist must build matter into his metaphysics, 
So he must build some perception of it into his epistemology. Now, the extent of these people's commitment to perceptual data varies widely from case to case. And it depends entirely on the extent of their religiosity. The more religious, the fewer material things they think are important or sensory perception. The less religious, the more. Now, I think the uh, above is the broader reason why Descartes bases uh, knowledge on God's goodness. If concepts, some or all, think of this problem, have to correspond to percepts of which they are logically and genetically independent, how is it possible that that correspondence will take place? And the only answer seems to be, well, second best answer, through the agency of some kind of divinely ensured harmony, what Leibniz called pre-established harmony. God watches over to make sure that your concepts will match up uh, with your percepts, which is the only way you could do it since you can't get them from your percept. Now, I want to stress again that this is not just a potpourri, a miscellany of ideas that these people pick from the air. Secularism for Descartes is not independent of Platonism. It's not something arbitrarily added on to Platonism. On the contrary, from his point of view, Platonism logically necessitates secularism. Uh, uh, for Descartes and this whole school, uh, God uh, is not an escape from this world. God is a means of grounding and validating uh, this world. It's because this world flows from God that we can trust it and it's real. Nor does Descartes uh, scorn natural science. He acclaims it as a product of non-natural ideas. So this world and perceptual knowledge are, are good, they're valid, they're important because they are creations of overseen by, derived from the non-natural and the non-material. You get the fact that that is therefore a system. That's an integration. You might not like it, but you won't like a lot of integration. But you can, you can explain everything as part of that totality. Now, Spinoza is an even better example, but uh, he's a great philosopher, by the way, on his own terms. He even has a lot of really true things. So I'm just going to mention it in passing, but if you have a couple of months free, you should read his book. According to Spinoza, Spinoza is a pantheist. Reality is God. God is an entity with infinite attributes, only two of which we can know, and those are mind and matter. So Plato's idealism is false on the face of it. The concretes of the physical world, just as of the mental, flow from and express God's nature, and it's therefore a complete mistake metaphysically to treat one of them as a despised stepchild of another higher reality. Once again, he certainly believes in God, all is God. He's been called the God-intoxicated man, but he, part of that for him is the absolute reality of the physical world. Now, again, in epistemology, there's always two issues, reality and concepts, percepts. That, those two, as we'll see, are going to define all the combinations, are going to define all the different approaches to integration. Spinoza is a rationalist. His work is deliberately modeled on geometry. What is it called? Ethics uh, demonstrated geometrically, but the title is in Latin, and then it's everything is numbered, and the propositions, the scolia, etc. And there's articles in journals, book one, scolia, 13 to chapter two, proposition, whatever. However, like Descartes, he cannot rest content with a system of pure concepts. He repeatedly discusses observational phenomena. And he sees clearly the need to explain why it is that his system of detached ideas correlates 
with the world of material objects. And again, following Descartes and Augustine, he invokes God as the validator, but he does it in a really cute, unique way. Since both mind and body express equally the essence of God's nature, they're just two of his attributes, there must be a parallelism, a parallelism between them. Every mental event, including every idea, must have a physical correlate. That's inherent in the fact that each of them is expressing God, which each of them is. So uh, that's the psychophysical parallelism of Spinoza. It's the best attempt in the whole history of philosophy to explain the application to this world of non-worldly uh, ideas. Now, as in Descartes, Spinoza's Platonism is fundamental and his secularism is derivative, but for both men, nevertheless, the latter is real. So let's just sum up now the, the uh, worldly supernationalists from the point of view of their view of integration. It is crucial to integrate earthly facts. But this is ultimately impossible unless one also integrates the earthly to the unearthly. And it is necessary to integrate perceptual data, but this requires the use of products of the unearthly. In other words, concepts independent of persons. All right, now let's go to uh, the last one, the knowing skeptics. Now, that's a very different and distinctively modern. You don't see, you see some of the ones we've just done, but the ones we're coming to now, you see a lot more. Now, since the roots of this one are in Kant, he has no antecedents. Uh, in the ancient world, whereas you'll see, well, if you ever read part three of my book, uh, Descartes and Spinoza have many, many similar counterparts in the ancient world. In essence, this type of philosopher is an empiricist is still, who is still committed to fly even though his wings have been removed. Uh, now, one of the originators of this variant he was much too traditional uh, to apply his new principles consistently, but nevertheless, extremely influential start was Auguste Comte, uh, the coiner of positivism, and by the way, also of altruism. A philosopher who is much more influential than is normally given credit for. Kant, as I've said, is a Kantian skeptic on Kantian grounds. But he draws from this base a different conclusion than Kant. He drops the unknowable noumena precisely because they're unknowable. And of course, he then has to drop the noumenal mind, the mind as it is in itself with all its categories, the mind that's supposedly antecedent to and conditioning our experience. Well, what is he left with then? Well, he says, the sum of that which exists and the only possible object of knowledge is Kant's phenomenal world. Phenomenal world. Phenomenal stripped of the noumenal. And what is that? That's a world made of a stream of sense experiences. That's it. Now Kant gives his famous, uh, Kant gives his famous three stages of mankind's rise. First was the theological, which invokes supernatural causes to explain natural events. Next is the metaphysical, which uh, allegedly explains events, uh, worldly events, uh, but uses abstract, unobservable factors, supposedly lurking behind the scenes that do the explanation. For instance, the essences of things. Whoever saw an essence or the underlying nature of something. You can see its color and shape and something, but what is this underlying uh, nature? There's a whole bunch like that. So we have to get rid, rid of these things uh, because they're certainly not 
stream of experience. So finally, we get to the third stage, where man reaches intellectual maturity, and that's positivism. And positivism I define as exclusive concern. This is a fair definition. Exclusive concern with matters of fact open to sense experience while rejecting any speculation or theory about unperceived. All of the perennial questions about reality, therefore, which rationalists and even most empiricists had struggled with and claimed to answer, have to be thrown out. They should never have been asked. For instance, is there an external reality? That's a metaphysical question. I can see the apple, but what do you want me to see in order to say it's external? There's no experience of external that's out. Uh, the apple is, is it independent of us? You know, as a tree falls in the forest, who knows? Can you see what's there when you're not there? I mean, it's on the face of it. It's a metaphysical question. It can't be answered by uh, observation. Um, um, moreover, someone said to well, you believe then in the world of mere appearance, right? He says, that's ridiculous. How can I perceive a distinction between appearance and reality? There's two words for what I see, that's all. Uh, there's no perceptual way to grasp appearance, and therefore I don't, I, I won't answer is the world appearance or is it reality? It is, that's all I'll say. Um, and then his disciples, as uh, years went by, said that these questions are worse than invalid. They are absolutely meaningless because the sounds which you used to utter them describe nothing. That is nothing perceivable and therefore nothing. Now you can see, I think, that positivism, since it restricts itself so strongly to sense data, will have a definite and, in fact, in several ways, unprecedented animus against conceptual knowledge. Uh, the rejection of metaphysics is, is just one expression of this. It's tantamount to the banishment of concepts from philosophy. And how long can philosophy survive when you take concepts from it? Uh, but a related shrinkage in the role of concepts is to be found in their view of science. And remember, they treasure and admire the field of science. They despise metaphysics, but they present themselves as impassioned champions of science. But positivist science, scientists, Comte stresses, cannot use concepts in the attempt to discover the underlying causes of observed events. Such causes, being by definition unobservable, are metaphysical and are barred from rational consideration. What can science do then? Have you ever heard this one? Science can describe, but it cannot explain. It tells us how things happen, but not why. Well, what about you say all the broadly integrating concepts of science, like atoms, fields, forces, energy, a myth unperceivable, out. Now, thanks to Kant, positivism was the first movement, not of smart Alex sophists and the like, but of serious thinkers and scientists to de-emphasize and disparage concepts. They did not wage an all-out war on concepts, as Kant, Dewey, and uh, others did. But uh, they wage the opening battles uh, of that war while still holding on this school to some respect for concepts and making some use of them. Indeed, the defining task of science, Comte says, is to reach true generalizations about the facts of experience and thereby enable us to predict uh, the future. 
And he says these generals must be objective. This group, the positives, are very strong on objectivity. They must be formed in accordance, our generalizations, with actual perceptual similarities and differences. But note, a generalization on this theory is not a means of integrating into a unit observed and unobserved instances the way it is for objectivism. Why not? The unobserved instances, being limitless, are largely unobservable. So all a generalization can be, if we have to restrict ourselves to what we observe, is a summary of what we've observed, a summary of observed concretes. The applicability of a generalization beyond our experiences can't be known. Induction, therefore, is a leap in the dark, the laws of science are not certain, et cetera, et cetera. But, says Kant, that doesn't mean it's unimportant, you know, to, to generalize. Because that gives us, quote, practical certainty. Or as he also says, if we limit ourselves to the immediately surrounding natural world, and if we simply assume the uniformity of nature, in other words, the law of cause and effect, the law of cause and effect, the result, he says, will be of great practical value. Now, before Kant, you see, a cognitive process based on an unprovable assumption would have been rejected by philosophers as it was by Hume. But after Kant, the fact that an assumption is subjective is no bar to its acceptance. If such an assumption functions to pr promote science, after all, it's just a new version of Kant's categories. It's something that we're bringing to the table to make the world orderly. So, in sum, for the positivist, scientific knowledge consists only of surface descriptions, of sequences among relatively isolated batches of sense data. The batches are isolated <clears throat> because broad integrations are impossible, because there are no broad concepts whose can be perceived, whose relation to the world is open to direct perception. There are, in effect, the best way to put an objective is to, for this school, there are only lower-level concepts, which have, in effect, ostensive reference. And as long as your generaliz generalizations involve those, the more the merrier, tie, integrate, etc. But as soon as you get to a level of abstraction, beyond that, where you can't see directly the extensive instance, that's metaphysics. Now, I just want to say with regard to, I'm going to be calling it conceptual shrinkage, which we will be following. In other words, uh, continual refusal to use concepts to acquire knowledge, a con continual reduction of the realm to which they're applicable. There's a range of degrees. Uh, at the limit, of course, it's no longer empiricism or positivism, but becomes nihilism. And in relation to this spectrum, Comte himself is conservative, and he would undoubtedly have been appalled by later developments. It still remains true that his philosophy was one of the first influential intermediaries in this conceptual shrinkage, uh, between Kant and what was to come. Now I have a whole section here on John Stuart Mill, which I'm just going to drop, but I have to read you one quote from John Stuart Mill, uh, who's a, basically just a disciple of Kant. Quote, I consider it nothing less than a misfortune that the words concept, general notion, or any other phrase to, to express the supposed mental modification corresponding to a class name should ever have been invented. This is pretty clear. Now, just to conclude, I want to say that positivism is not a system of philosophy. It not only fails uh, to offer answers to the questions of philosophy, it insists on the illegitimacy of the questions. But the fact that it is not a system does not make Comte and Mill eclectics. On the contrary, the integrating principle of their approach is everywhere apparent. 
There is a world of objective facts, albeit only our experiences, and conceptualization based on these experiences is essential within highly circumscribed uh, limits. So to summarize, their message is not as in Kant, down with integration, nor as in Plato, Aristotle, and Descartes, integrate all things into a system by means of broad and certain principles, but rather integrate some things on a narrow level so far as lower level abstractions allow, while recognizing that many things unavoidably elude this attempt. Integration that is only partially worldly, the Deco, and a world susceptible to only partial integration, the Combe Mill. These are the two lesser but still significant variants to be added to uh, the three uh, archetypes. And we'll pursue this further next time. Now, next time, I actually get to present the dim hypothesis, all of which I've been building up to up to now. Now, we actually have some time for questions. I'm going to stay a little after the hour, but if you need to leave for lunch or it's too hot or whatever, uh, there's no hard feelings at all. Just get up and walk out. I'm sure if I were in your place, I would do that. So, <clears throat> yes. Could you say anything about pragmatism and how it would relate to uh, the two variants? Oh, well, uh, I would, uh, pragmatism is not one of the two variants. Pragmatism comes directly under Kant. And you'll see, I, I have five different classifications for the five. D, I, and M, and then I subdivide D and I subdivide M. And the, let's just say for the quick summary, there's the benign and the depraved form of D and of M. And the pure Kantian type is the worst form of D, and that's uh, Dewey. Dewey is, is one clear example. And you'll see, I don't want to say it right now, because when we get to education, we're going to be covering progressive education. And that will include Dewey and everything he's done to education. And you'll see that is very, very much in contrast to the, to the D1 approach to education, which is like... Uh, well, you'll see. I'm not going to give the whole lecture. You'll see. Yes. I have to remember to turn my head. Yes. Last time, you talked about integration as being the only way we can form concepts or use our mind, I forget your exact words. And differentiation, you said that, I, I, like, I guess I'd like you to talk about differentiation because what I'd heard before, I don't remember if it's from you or Harry, was that the two faculties of the mind are integration and differentiation. Well, I would put it this way. Certainly, that's in OPAR. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the thing is, differentiation by itself is something anyone on a lower and even a non-human level is capable of. He can't conceptualize his differentiation, but he can see, you know, this isn't this, this isn't this. By itself, that takes you nowhere. That is like the concrete bound mentality or you know, the people before Thales who don't say anything in common. The human element comes in when you can put together and see similarities as against this. Now, it's true, you have to see the similarity as differentiated from something else. But what is important is that you do see the similarity and that then you can do something to take everything in that class and put it together in one unit. Now, again, that unit is of no use unless you can differentiate it from other units. So differentiation runs always all the way through. But the, the, it, it is, I would say, it's like the valet uh, of human knowledge. Whereas integration is like the lord of the manor. Uh, integration is what a human knowledge consists of. But to acquire and to maintain, it has to be continually separated. But the separation per se isn't, takes you nowhere, you see. That's the best I could do. I, I, it's a good question because you can't, uh, you can't uh, integrate uh, without differentiating. You would have the one without the many. But we're taking for granted that you can perceive the many. And then the idea 
thought is trying to grasp the one. If, if we didn't have the many, there'd be no thought. And we have to distinguish them. Yeah. I wonder if you could say a bit more about uh, pre-Kantian empiricisms, particularly Hobbes and, and Locke, uh, and how they relate to D on the one hand and to Aristotle on the other. Because they're not, as you described it, they're not quite in either category. Yeah, no, I don't think every philosopher <coughs> is, uh, comes under one of my categories. I think every philosopher that produced a systematic a, a approach to integration uh, and thereby influence a culture for centuries is. And that's all I'm trying to get to. Now, if you take uh, Locke, for instance, Locke is not at all a consistent philosopher. I mean, you could say no philosophers are consistent, but I mean, in the way in which Descartes is consistent, Augustine is consistent, Hegel is consistent. Locke is a hodgepodge. You can find uh, in Locke strong elements of Aristotle, strong elements of Christianity, strong elements of Descartes, with no idea that there's any uh, uh, inconsistency. Uh, you know, it's been said, he's like the Bible. You can find in him uh, uh, whatever you want. So it would be impossible to get out of Locke a theory or a view of how to use your mind in integrating. You know, he thinks logic is, I mean, excuse me, ethics is purely uh, deductive from floating abstractions. And uh, politics, he bases on uh, observation. And knowledge, he bases on uh, introspection, as far as I can tell, because he says there is no way to know the outside world, etc. So he is, a, let's call him in a friendly way, a transition figure. And I can't, uh, it's simply not, uh, of significance culturally. Now, that doesn't mean he can't come up with a theory, uh, for instance, rights, which will have a tremendous influence. But what it does mean is it wouldn't have a tremendous influence unless there were people of the Enlightenment point of view who had already a method of integration and then jumped on that and were able to, you know, I don't think... If you gave Locke a Constitution Hall on limited time and service, he could come up with the Declaration of Independence. I just don't think that would be possible. But, you know, he came up with something on, on rights. So, um, as you'll see, I'm going to get uh, later, in fact, I think it's next time, to the existence of mixed cases. That is, cases where, you know, uh, they have uh, a number of elements of different methods of integration, and one is stressed in one aspect and one in another. And then you have to decide. I decide by the Trinity. What's essential, what's new, what's influential? Uh, but there are also cases where nothing is essential because it's methodically contradicted everywhere. And so all you have to say is this is, this is a transition or this is nothing. There's a lot of philosophers who are simply nothing on my view because I'm concerned with, you know, not just the big three, but whoever has a philosophy which promotes a view of integration. Now, I don't know enough about Hobbes to know that he does. He's an empiricist. He, uh, as far as I know, he's got rationalist uh, elements uh, in him. Um, he has some kind of... Uh, um, psychology or a theory of psychology, but what he says about integration, if anything, he believes in this world, but he believes it's caused by God. Uh, and um, uh, what is his view of conceptualization? That's what I'd like to know. Uh, he's a, a total nominalist, as far as I am. Well, if he's a total nominalist, then he can't, and he carries it out, then he, he certainly can't. Then what would you put him as? Then he, he can't really believe in God, and he can't really believe in, in reality. He'll have to be a, a proto-positivist. Uh, uh, that's, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. A lot of these yeah. figures lock in his worst moments, and Hobbes seem like they're proto-D, and I was wondering about that and, and how it's, it... It's possible, but only in retrospect. I don't think Locke or Hobbes or, or any of them before Kant, Hume, at, in their worst, most drunken orgy 
would have dreamt of the destruction that uh, that Khan unleashed. So I'd be very hesitant. I say, you can say there's element in here which, if made a whole philosophic approach, would be D or whatever. But I I, I don't. Uh, I don't see that. There are so many philosophers, usually minor ones or transition ones, uh, that uh, you can't really classify. But in every case, so far as I know, they had no influence. There's, there's an Aristotelian era. There's a Hegelian era. There's a, certainly a Kantian era. There's an Augustinian era. There's no Hobbesian era. There's no Lockean era. I mean, there's no Barclayan era. There's just, uh, there's not enough there, and it's not new enough, and, it's, and it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't reach into men's minds and tell them, this is how you must think about everything. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to say something. A man can be great in his work, and that does not mean he will be culturally influential. And you know, the, I think the best example of which shocked me, but is absolutely true. Now, it's out of philosophy and literature. Shakespeare was not an influential writer. And he's a great writer, but there is no such thing as a Shakespearean era. He's not a classicist. He's not a romanticist. He's not a naturalist. There was no... I think people couldn't live up to uh, his genius. Uh, the most you could say is he takes from the Greeks an element which is characterization, large-scale characterization, and, and theme. But, uh, uh, so in that sense, he wasn't, he wasn't an original way of integrating, which is what, I, which is what I'm looking for. But the, in other words, I'm, by leaving someone out, I'm not derogating him as unimportant. I'm saying he didn't provide to a culture this particular advice and guidance that would shape everything in that culture. The reason I had asked is because I was wondering about the role that empiricism plays in uh, getting the the, uh, moderate disintegrators going. And so is it right to say that uh, what the empiricists had, these early empiricists, wasn't an approach to integration, but a a pro-perception orientation and, uh, in effect, a a poverty on their view of integration? And it's those things together. But the form of it is a lack of appreciation of concepts. That is their essential flaw. The idea that, you know, we want to be hard-headed in this world, what we can see. And at first, you know, they had general rules for the direction of the mind, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then gradually, it just fell apart into what, what you're calling nominalism, staying away from that in this course. But uh, I, th- I think it's true what you say. Yes. Um, in relation to yesterday's lecture, you were talking about the one and the many and you distinguish between uh, certain holes that we were going to consider, which were cognitive holes, and then uh, did you mean metaphysical holes we're not going to consider versus the man-made holes are, are the ones that we're going to be discussing? I, I, I'm concerned only with human action, with what we do in creating the cultural products that reflect what our society is, novels and schools and political systems, etc., I'm not concerned with the solar system, which we did not create. I'm not concerned with the galaxies. I'm not concerned with the law of gravity. That is outside of us. Uh, So uh, I think that's pretty clear. Are you saying that um, that Kant uh, was an anti-integrator because he rejected concepts and percepts as unreal? Because you, you said that he thought the categories were the integrating mechanism uh, of the human mind. So, so is the reason he is an anti-integrator, uh, is the reason that he is an anti-integrator is because he thought concepts and percepts were, were unreal? Not at all. You've got that backward. He was an anti-integrator because he regarded integration as the disqualifier of consciousness. Right. And the manifestation of that is that any of our concepts or percepts are restricted to an unreal reality. And the, the reason I got confused is because you said that he regarded the categories as, as the integrators. That's right. They are the 
They are the integrators of the raw data and thereby create our world. But the world that they create is an unreal world. Right. And therefore, any concepts and percepts that we form from it are unreal. So the fact that they integrate, are you you, if I understand you're trying to say, because they integrate, therefore he's in favor of integration? Well, no, I'm trying to, to find out why, what, what is the primary reason he's an anti-integrator? I'm sorry, I can't make it any clearer. Yes. There's this saying that uh, every person is either a Platonist or an Aristotelian. Yeah. Does your theory imply that this saying has to be dismissed? No, I would say that Kant in fundamentals is a Platonist. Uh, another uh, uh, reality, you know, that supersedes this one. But uh, he is a, as a wicked a Platonist as you can get. And in regard to the approach to integration, he is definitely different. And I'd have to say everybody is, actually I say everybody is one of five. But if you want to strip the variance out, one of three, uh, even though on the very broad fundamentals, it's basically this world or another. And both Kant and Plato are another. They're both idealists uh, in that sense. Although Kant and us. I think the previous questioner on this side was in his question getting at the following, um, which I want to raise, but perhaps this will be a clearer form. Um, if we talk about invalid integration, we could say there are these transcendental things beyond the world of experience and they make the world what it is. And we could have a fantasy about that, as Plato and Augustine and Hegel do. Or we could have that position without the illusion and just say, yes, we're integrating by something unreal. And I know it's not real. I know that there isn't really the form of the good. It's just my concepts. Alternatively, we could say, you know, against integration, we could say, look, there's nothing we can really do to put the world together, which is what I think Hume says. And I think that is just culturally, at least, inefficacious, except to maybe set up other worse views, because how could you live by don't uh, do anything? I'll have to go more briefly, because I, I don't have that kind of memory anymore. Uh, can well, I just answer what I think you're saying? But if you're not saying it, that's still the best I can do. You're trying to say that Kant is integrating just as Plato is, but Plato is fooling himself into saying that he's integrating reality, whereas Kant is being honest about it. Is that correct? Yes, I'm saying that Kant is both Plato without illusion and Hume without scruples, but it's both. Well, I tried to say at the beginning what I took as reality, uh, what objectivism takes as reality, and uh, what knowledge was, which was the awareness of what was out there independent of us. Now, according to that definition, Plato believes in reality, an external reality, which is what it is and which we are trying to know. He was not an advocate of the Copernican revolution. You think it's a, it's a fantasy. He tried to prove in many ways, uh, using innate ideas, that this was a reality. And I believe he was trying to, to prove that. Uh, that he was mistaken does not mean he was deluding or an illusion or whatever you call it. Kant is not trying to prove that he knows the reality. He is trying to prove that any such idea as an existence independent of us to which we should turn our mind and uh, acquire knowledge is out. That the whole thing is inconceivable. That we, all we can know is what we do with whatever is out there which we can never know. Now, if you try to tell me both of those are the same. It's just that Kant was honest and Plato was not. I don't, excuse me. That was a rhetorical question. I don't, will not argue indefinitely. I'm just too old for it. Yes. So you got at this somewhat with Greg's question, but with your answer to Greg's question, but I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the relationship between the approaches to integration and rationalism. Between? The approaches to integration and rationalism and empiricism, kind of the broad 
rationalism and empiricism that you discuss in understanding objectivism? Yeah. Um, because well, it seems, I mean, it seems as the way you're presenting it now is that the D approach is empiricism plus. I never con. said a word about D. Well, the the alternate the um, the con. So the 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 non-integrating approach is empiricism plus Kant. Um, that's, that that's one version of it, and then there's the the Comte version, which is some integration. I mean, based on observation and generalization. Right. Those aren't the same thing. In other words, positivism is not the same thing as nihilism. Right. It has empiricism. So you, you, how does this relate to empiricism? And well, as I understand your understanding of objectivism course, the kind of methodology of empiricism yeah. and rationalism, they are, at least in a sense, approaches to integration. Um, the rational, yeah. so yeah. I was just wondering if you could just... Well, uh, in that course, I used empiricism very broadly. For anybody that uh, is at home, that was a how-to course. And was for anybody who was at home with observation and concrete, but it was out of their depth and felt uh, uh, that they couldn't function if, uh, as soon as they got to broad conceptual integration. That's what I called empiricism. And we even said at that time, if you'll forgive me that, uh, I say that to half the class here, that women were more inclined to empiricism. And then we said rationalism was the other approach. Namely, people were at home with broad abstractions and loved to deduce all of objectivism from A as A without any reference to uh, observation, but felt lost when they had to actually read the paper and figure out what do these concretes mean. I was contrasting it in that broad way, but I'm looking at it in a more technical and in a much more specific way now. I'm not simply saying, are you at home in concretes and, uh, or do you like floating abstractions? I'm saying, how would you put together a view of abstractions and a view of reality that would lead to a method of how to integrate the data that confronts you in any given field. That is, uh, the only similarity is that empiricism broadly means you start with experience and build from there. But the early empiricists thought you could build a lot. Then by the time they got to Hume, they thought you could build nothing. And then by the time they got through Kant, they thought you could build a little bit. Uh, uh, the rationalists said you have to be, you know, in your world of abstractions, and then they got down to, uh, to Descartes and Spinoza, and it has to be uh, in this world. Uh, so it, it depends. I'm making more distinctions because I have a different purpose in mind, and that is not to... That course was called Understanding Objectivism, if I remember. My, my goal is not to help people understand objectivism, but to show that a certain view of concepts in relation to percepts, has tremendous, and a certain view of reality correlated to it, has a tremendous influence on what creators in all the main intellectual artistic fields actually do. And it does so through their idea of what should be their policy in regard to integration. That, that is a much more specific uh, uh, policy a purpose than uh, simply to try to say to, to, to males, drop your floating abstractions. See what I mean? Now, how are we doing? Okay, 12 o'clock, okay, thanks.